former state legislators as well, with uh, former state representative Dave Ajima and also former state representative Tom Hooker. And uh, we're uh, joined also by a very special lady, Beverly Fields, whose husband Jim uh, passed away in a nursing home. And, uh, and we're gonna be talking about a cease and desist letter that we have issued um, on behalf of the people of Michigan, on behalf of former state legislators, and uh, and the cease and desist letter is issued to uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer and Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. We've also copied uh, Attorney General, United States Attorney General William Barr on this note. And really what we're asking for is a return to law and order, restoration of the rule of law. The governor and her uh, many of her executive orders related to the COVID-19 emergency have been unlawful at their face. And, and uh, what we really want to emphasize is that uh, she's been portrayed by a lot of people um, as being helpful with these executive orders. Matter of fact, she's taking credit for saving a lot of lives. And as Beverly can attest to, and a lot of people across the state of Michigan can attest to, her executive orders have been anything but helpful. They've been harmful. And it's about time that we got the, the story out about exactly that. So without further ado, I want to introduce, first of all, uh, Beverly Fields, and uh, she can tell you a little bit about what she faced with her husband in a nursing home. My name you heard was Beverly Fields. Uh, my husband was Jim Fields, 81 years of age, a veteran of four years, had many comorbidities, and uh, my story began on 319. On 319 this year, uh, my husband had had a peg line put in because he had a enterobacteria, and they determined he would need infusions every four hours around the clock. And I had already been aware that there was concern about the COVID at that point. And they said that I would have to leave the hospital per the governor's directive. So that evening, very shortly after his peg line had been put in place, the nurse in charge of that particular floor came in and asked me to leave my husband's bedside. I had been his advocate, also his emotional support. She remarked to my husband and I that we could do video or face FaceTime. Well, that's not something most 81-year-old people do without some training. At that point, I was led to believe that they would help us with that. Well, the next day, as I, as I had been told, they would transfer him in a van to Brighton Wellbridge, which is supposed to be a 4.5-star facility with an outstanding reputation. He was transferred there, but they were in lockdown. My husband would never be able to leave that room. He would only be allowed to get his physical therapy and walk around his bedside or however he was directed. Mind you, they've often said that people of his age were of the gravest risk. Why do you take a person with the known comor comorbidities that he had and the medical needs that he had, and they were numerous. He was a diabetic. Yes, he was a well-managed diabetic. He was a person that had three heart valves done, one at St. Joe's, two in Cleveland. Okay, so he was a prime example of the very people that this governor professed to protect. She lied. She outright lied. That next day, as he was transferred, there was already a, a message put forth on their website that stated they needed PPE and other uh, amenities to provide care to the patients there. Well, with that having happened, my husband had been there as of 3.20. On Easter Sunday, uh, there was a letter placed in his room about them treating a COVID patient in the facility and that if I had questions, I could call. Well, that was another one of the many issues of having a loved one in the facility. Many times there was no one to answer the phone and there was no way to reach them. Okay, so on that Sunday, there was no one I could call. The following day, I called to ask where this COVID patient was. 
had the staff that is providing care for that COVID patient cared for my husband in the last 10 days. I wanted to have some understanding of what his, his risk. My husband had a BiPAP, which also shows he had respiratory issues. So with that said, they turned around and uh, had Here? not answered oh, yeah. my questions. Okay. My family, our family, is in California, Thousand Oaks, California. A daughter is in Encinitas. Another part of our family is in Arizona. Okay, so I had been commuting by telephone to share with them how I was being removed from, from his emotional support. And he didn't have FaceTime while he was there except one occasion with our son who lives in Thousand Oaks and three grandchildren there. Okay, as his stay continued on uh, a few days after Easter, I had noticed there were changes. The only way I could visit him was through a screened window in a courtyard. Okay, so I noticed that he didn't seem well. I wanted to call someone's attention to it couldn't reach anyone, couldn't go in the door or get anyone's attention. Another party was there who had a father that was 90 plus years old, and he too shared my same concern that he couldn't get through to anyone. So I drove around the building. I saw a nurse that was going inside because she had a lunch sack, so I, I, I just wanted to contact anyone I could to let them know the phones were not working so that they could address this. She remarked to me, who are you inquiring about? And I said, all of your residents, your phones are not working, mm -hmm. okay? And to verify that, when I called on another occasion, I received a recording of someone that was talking about placing two patients in the facility and how it would strengthen their case. What I did at that point was call my son in Thousand Oaks and say, mom didn't miss dial. Please call this number and verify the recording that I have heard. I also called another close friend who's a retired nurse and had her verify the recording that I had listened to. Okay? With that said, the next I, I tried to leave a message at their website. At their website, there was no way to get a live response. I tried their corporate office, which was through Nexus. By 8.30 the next morning, I had not heard back from them. So I returned, and my family was aware how alarmed I was. My husband's projected discharge date was supposed to have been April 27th. Well, that next morning when I returned there, they had an aide answer the phone in his room for the very first time. And as I went to the window, they said that I had caused a commotion the night before when I had gone around the building to try and find out how I could reach my husband and, and bring attention to their phones being out of order. Okay? So, I see my husband. I didn't want to upset my husband. The aide that was in the room, I asked her if she could get a supervisor. She didn't come back. So I went ahead and I collected myself because there was no way my husband wasn't up to talking on the phone very much then. And I didn't want to disturb him anymore. I went back to my car and I pulled in a handicapped parking space. And I was sitting there thinking, who do I call? Can I call the health department? Can I call the police department? Can I call Medicare? What can I do? What are my options? Can I call the fire department? Who do I rely on given the lockdown? Well, in my excitement, I got Livingston, New York Health Department. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a Livingston, New York. So I, I disconnected, excused myself from that. And as that has occurred, these two employees from the facility came out to my car and said that I had to leave, that I was loitering. And, that if, and I said, you have to understand, no supervisor has contacted me, no one has has answered my request. Well, you knocked on another patient's window and you create, created a disturbance. Well, what else was I to do? So at that point, I said to them, call the police. Well, they called the police. Two state trooper vehicles came and I said, I'm, I'm not armed. I'm not mentally ill. Yes, I'm distressed, 
I have a severe stress and anxiety over what is happening that I can't reach my loved one. The officer that came to the window of my car said, my grandmother recently died in one of these facilities. I'll take care of this. That was all that was said that morning. It didn't help me, you know, get in to see my husband, but it delayed my concerns that someone heard my concern and that he would express the, the, the harm that was being brought about their lack of interest. So with that said, on 418, which was that upcoming Saturday, my husband had severe dehydration and arrhythmia. Well, given the heart history and the other comorbidities, um, yes, he was going to need emergency care. My sister had called. My sister reached for someone through their phone and they told her, which is breaking HIPAA, that my husband, Jim Fields, was being transferred to St. Joe's, Joseph uh, Mercy in Ann Arbor. That's breaking HIPAA. What laws am I bound to? Why is it the set of laws that they impose upon me that strip away my rights to visit my loved one of 48 years, 81 years of age, an American citizen, a person who had admiration for that flag and everything it encompasses today. And they were stripping away rights at every level because they were also imposing fear on me. Then they turn around, he goes to St. Joe's, Ann Arbor, and I'm not allowed to see him. <laughs> The doctor says to me promptly, um, he will go to CCU. He tested positive for COVID at that point. Okay, so that means he acquired that COVID in that 4.5 star Wellbridge facility where he never left his room, where a patient entered his room on two different occasions and staff had to come and, and accompany that person back to their room. That, my husband, being in CCU, they seemed to be able to help him with his heart rate, and they said there would be a second COVID blood test that they would have a, a result from. Well, they affirmed, yes, he definitely had COVID. All right. At that point, the next doctor comes into the picture, and that doctor calls me and said, do you want your husband resuscitated? And I said, at what risk? to you. You know, I had a durable power of health care for my husband. I had been asked that at many junctures. They weren't going to allow me to see him, but they wanted to know whether he, he should get CPR. That was a difficult question. At that point, I called my family and I said, I have until 3 o'clock and I'm going to call him back and let him know my answer. My son said, Mom, I'll support whatever you choose. Well, I'm a prayerful person. I prayed, okay? I called back and I, I felt that all of the many health risks that Jim had, those comorbidities, that I didn't want to endanger the doctor. So I said, no, do not resuscitate if his heart stops. If his heart stops. Then he comes back to me, do you want him on a ventilator? Well, my husband had had sepsis a few years ago and had been on a ventilator. I know the value of a ventilator, but I also know how difficult it is. You can't talk and the risk is great. I didn't want him put through that again. I wasn't trying to sentence him to death. I asked if what their protocol was for this COVID. Hydrochloroquine wasn't their protocol. Now, why is it that they get to impose that upon my husband without my awareness as to the choices that he would be entitled to? They in turn offered me on the 22nd of April, the antibodies through Mayo Clinic, okay? And I had to sign the paperwork over, over the computer, resubmit it to them as I did, okay? Well, my husband, on 424 died. 
on 424. He was to have come home on 427. On 425, after Lynch funeral home received his body, I asked if I might follow them to the crematorium. So I rode alone. My sister wouldn't enter my house. She had her husband wear a mask, come inside and present an angel. All right? Another party followed. We went there to follow my husband to Pontiac where he was cremated. And I rode alone. I had his flag they presented through the window. I had had a FaceTime with him when he was unconscious because of the thoughtful student nurse that had been at his bedside. But he wasn't able to talk to me nor open his eyes. Is this, is this the American way? I don't think so. They took away so many different freedoms at so many junctures. Non-scientific executive orders resulted in more deaths, a crumbling economy, loss of jobs, loss of businesses, and neighbor against neighbor. When Governor Whitmer went against right to try drugs, as she just mentioned, like hydrochloroquine, and threatened doctors with loss of licenses, she made herself a medical doctor instead of a liberal lawyer and governor. We've had many pandemics in the past. None were quarantined. Let me give you an example here. 2002. The West Nile virus is going to kill us all. 2003, SARS is going to kill us all. 2005, the bird flu is going to kill us all. 2006, Ebola is going to kill us all. 2009, the swine flu is going to kill us all. 2014, the Zika virus is going to kill us all. 2019, the COVID-19 is going to kill all of us. But this, this, this time, the healthy people will turn us without due process. That's the first time in our history, folks. So I want to say something, I'm going to repeat it twice so you can get this. Often, you can detect the author of the crisis by who plays the problem solver and who profits from it. Let me say that again. Often, you can detect the author of the crisis by who plays the problem solver and who profits from it. Whitmer greatly desired the VP slot for Biden, and he wanted to take Michigan for Trump. She's a perfect example of the Peter Principle. She used a voluminous amount of executive orders to cover for that incompetence. May this lawsuit be heard by the federal government away from liberal judges in Michigan. And may this never happen and we may we never be abused by our government again. We stand here before you as former state reps and senators. Not one active senator or representative wanted to put their name to this lawsuit. That's a sad commentary. Where's the guts to stand up for what's right? Adding to the irony, uh, this past week the C CDC just admitted that only 6% of the 161,392 deaths recorded actively died solely from COVID. That's much less than the common flu. The deaths from common flu are nearly five times that of the COVID-19 virus. Folks, we've been had. The science was bad, the numbers were inflated, and the governor's solutions are and were severely flawed. There's no doubt that COVID is real, but the way it was handled was just plain wrong and abusive and resulted in the deaths of persons and their economy. She must be stopped and governor, government officials must be, be reined back from abusing their state and federal legal authority and the powers granted by our state constitution and the federal constitution. Thank you. I am Tom Hooker, former state representative, former teacher, coach, and currently I'm serving as township supervisor at Byron Township in southwest Kent County. Lottery tickets and what she considered non-essential churches, nursing homes, schools, businesses, even outdoor businesses. It's a travesty that Governor Gretchen Whitmer has kept our state's most vulnerable citizens locked away from their loved ones. As you heard our, our uh, testimony from Beverly, while sending COVID positive patients into those same nursing homes. I know many dementia and Alzheimer's patients, as well as aged seniors who try to understand masks 
and not seeing loved ones they know facing in many cases death locked up by themselves. I've gone to actually call legislators to try to get them to be allowed to, family members to be allowed to access their loved ones in hospitals and in nursing homes. And they died unable to do that. It's totally wrong and it's time their voices are heard. Please su uh, support the North American Law Center as it takes this case forward to end the clear departure from any level of common sense. The, Americans, uh, the North American Law Center is northamericanlawcenter.org and you can support them there. out of their schedule here to join us today. This is pretty important. None of us are running for any more elected office. This is a case of folks just looking to stay in the limelight or get new limelight for a new position that we're running for. I'm almost done with this term as Byron Township Supervisor. Dave's done. I'm done. But our, our oath of office that we took to support the Constitution, that's not done. And we've got citizens like Beverly here that are not alone. This is just one story. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that happening with all the mm -hmm. thousands of people who have died inside of our nursing homes? That same story is repeated thousands of times over and over again. So how can we as former state representatives, with a little bit of a, a uh, podium, we know that how important it is to get the message out and talk to people uh, about what's going on and let them know about what's going on. This is why it's important for us to get out here and talk about it, guys. I, we can't be silent about this. And it, it, me when I see this governor going off and claiming that she's saving people's lives. That's not the case. Beverly's testimony is just one of those testimonies. I can go into what she did with the right to try law while she abridged that and threatened the license of the physicians if they prescribed hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. yep. for COVID-19 patients. We have to call this out. So guys, I, I just, um, whatever you can do to please help us get the word out. We submitted formal letters to Governor Whitmer and to Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist and also copied uh, Attorney General Barr on this. We are looking for action, not just platitudes, not just like, not from our representatives who are serving this building behind us saying, yeah, what she's doing is really, really bad. We can't let her keep doing that, but taking no action. We need to take action. We're taking what action we can in our limited capacity right now. Now, Beverly's taking action. She's talking about a situation where I'm sure she doesn't want to be talking about this situation over and over again. This is not something that's very comfortable for anybody to go up and talk to. But if she doesn't talk out, who is? We all have to get the word out, counter this false narrative that this, uh, what's going on right now with our governor right now, you know, we're supposed to be a constitutional republic. All the laws that we're supposed to be following from a federal perspective are in here and this being constitutional is not much larger. She has issued no less than 174 executive orders. If I were to print those out, it would stack up like this. That's what a banana republic looks like. This is what a constitutional republic looks like. She is following political science, not medical science. It's about time she be, she's held accountable. And if she ignores our cease and desist letters, we're not going away. We're going to make sure that everybody is, uh, un understands exactly what she's up to and, uh, and get the truth out so that folks like Beverly don't have to be up here talking about painful circumstances or loss of their loved ones. And with that, I think it's uh, fair to say we'll open it up for any questions that people might have. Well, Patrick, are you going to go to the uh, federal court um, if she doesn't cease and desist? We're looking at all the different options that we have associated with that, and part of the reason why we cc um, Attorney General Barr was to make sure that we have uh, some action taken by our federal uh, prosecutors as well. We've got Matthew Snyder sitting out here representing <coughs> Southeast Michigan in particular. We'd like to see some action coming out of there. We know that they've issued a request for information specific to this case. So there is a growing interest at the federal level around situations like what's happening here in Beverly. The Department of Justice has laid, uh, labeled a name four different states which Michigan is one that they're very interested in. And Governor Whitmer is, uh, is, on, Governor Whitmer is on that list, <laughs> shopping list, if you will, of the Department of Justice. So yes, this is very appropriate. This is the kind of thing. So what are you guys hoping to achieve with this 
about lawsuit because um, a lot of people would say these executive orders have happened, they've passed. Like, what, what do you guys think about this? Frankly, the key thing right now is the burdens. There's only one side of the narrative that's being told on this. That's it. When the legislature went off and pushed forward on their lawsuit, what that does inside the caucus essentially becomes a gag order on all the senators and the state reps because they're told that if you speak out, you're going to be um, you're going to be putting our court case in jeopardy. That's what all the legal beagles inside a caucus talk about. We all know that. We've been there, um, and it was designed to shut up the members of the caucus from speaking out. We can't be silent on this. We have to get the word out about what's happening here. And it's, this is not a lawsuit. This is a cease and desist letter. This is like as former legislators saying, enough is enough. If we have to take legal action, I mean, I was, Kyle, you were there present a week ago around Ingham County. We filed four cases, um, or we did file formal lawsuits against the governor and against Secretary of State. That's it. Um, yeah, so by repealing some of these unlawful executive orders, restore the rule of law, start protecting families like Beverly's from having to go through that same situation where they got a loved one who is put in a at-risk situation deliberately by the policies of our governor. We need to take a stand. So really, the key point of what we're trying to do is get the word out, because it is not getting out. And I'm tired of, her, of this governor getting cover, um, treat, being treated like she's actually helping people when she's doing the exact opposite. It can be proved that Governor Whitmer and three or four other governors colluded in this <laughs> to put these people in uh, these restaurants knowing that some would die. Oh, yeah. That's a very severe jail term. That's one reason I put my name on this instead of putting it through our bar at the National Guard. Our courts here, we knew that Shirky and the Champion put their uh, little bill in there. We knew it was going to be thrown out by the uh, war courts, and I'm sure that the Supreme Court of the state of Michigan will probably throw it out too. It's one primary by the liberal Democrat. Barr is looking at this. He knows this is a big issue. If she's convicted of that, she'll see jail One thing I want to make clear, this isn't a Republican versus Democrat thing. This is a right versus wrong issue. We're probably more critical of our folks with ours next to their name that we used to serve with than we are even of the governor. The governor, we knew she was going to act this way. Right. We were hoping for a little bit of fearlessness from the folks we used to serve with, and we're not seeing any of that, at least not in any critical mass or not in any leadership manner. I know for a fact a lot of the state reps and state senators are doing stuff on a onesie twosie basis. They're going off and writing letters on behalf of half the constituents, but there is no unified effort to go off and, and highlight what this governor is doing. Not since day one. Since day one, they could have been just asking something simple, saying, Please show us the science. Don't just show us somebody in a white lab coat that you say, she said to go off and do this and say that's your science. No, no, no. I want to see the actual scientific white paper. People can do critical thinking on their own. That way she's held accountable for what her actions are. So if those scientific reports that she's leaning on tend to come into disrepute or they change with their conclusions, then she's held accountable for those changes as well. And she should be changing too. But she's hiding behind... Is she uses the term science, but she doesn't show any evidence of it. It's, it is all political science. It's nothing to do with medical science. My wife's a doctor. We can go off and translate any medical document you want to go off and look into. And she's just pulling the wool over her eyes. She needs to be held accountable. And I appreciate you guys being out here because the, the key question she needs to be asked about is show us the specific science behind each one. Don't show us somebody in a lab coat. Show us the actual scientific evidence. Yeah. She is acting like a doctor, and you know that with your, your wife being a doctor. The other thing is make sure everybody knows that at NorthAmericanLawCenter.org, the letter is there. Pull it offline, sign it, certify it, get it to the governor, and get it to Bill Barr right now. We need everybody in Michigan doing this right now. That's NorthAmericanLawCenter.org. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Patrick, turn this off now, right? Okay, questions? there we go. I think. I really